I'm not going to name names, but if you could take your seats, please. Thank you. Uh, the first item on the agenda today is uh, apologies, and uh, we have um, apologies from um, councillors Jimmy Chen, um, Mike Davidson, Sarah Templeton, and Yanni Johansson, um, and uh, and also from our chief executive, but um, not recorded as an apology. Just to explain to uh, everyone that the reason for the absences is that there is a clash with today's meeting and the uh, Zone 5-6 meeting of um, Local Government New Zealand. So uh, we had a consideration as to whether we would proceed with this meeting or, or defer the meeting until we had all of our councillors uh, here. We decided to proceed with the meeting and um, not deal with any sort of particularly controversial matters, but deal with matters that we could um, uh, follow up today so as not to um, build a backlog of, um, of agenda items for, for next week, um, which of course is a, a community board week. So um, uh, I'll move that the apologies be accepted. Uh, Andrew Turner will second that, and I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Um, and I haven't. I've, I have some declarations of interest in that the CCHL items, the annual report and the um, appointment paper in the PX session, um, the CCHL directors uh, uh, will stand back from those items. So, if we could um, start with our public participation, and could I welcome Sarah Dean and Dr. Shane Turner, representing um, the Road Accident Remembrance Day Trust. Um, the Traffic Accident Trauma Charitable Trust regarding the Road Accident Remembrance Day on Saturday the 3rd of November. I hope everyone's got that um, in their diaries and that everyone's uh, all prepared to uh, put this on social media to assist with the ad ad advertising of uh, what is a very important day. So thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Olivia and councillors for the opportunity to speak. Um, Yes, yeah, so I'm Sarah Dean. Um, I'm the founder, general manager of the Road Traffic Accident Trauma Charitable Trust, and I'd like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Shane Turner, um, newly appointed trustee. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm Shane Turner. I'm a uh, road safety specialist, having been working here in Canterbury since about 2000 uh, in the road safety field, doing work across uh, New Zealand and Australia, uh, research and um, more um, uh, applied research. Uh, or road safety work, um, and I'm really delighted to get involved with the trust. The trust has expanded out of, obviously, the important area of um, the interests of people who are involved in or affected by road uh, trauma, and um, the first responders to looking at the prevention side, which I work in, around how we can actually reduce the amount of trauma on our roads. So that's the area that I'm particularly uh, a specialist in. Um. Yes, yeah, so the Road Accident Remembrance Day, uh, this year is our third annual event. Um, it's going to be held in North Hagley Park um, on Saturday the 3rd of November, 10.30am. Um, so the main purposes of the Remembrance Day is to um, acknowledge the survivors, acknowledge the, those who tragically lost their lives on our road in the Kentu region. Um, in particular, we pay significance to these who particularly lost their lives in the roads in the past year. Um, we also have like a white cross ceremony um, bearing each person's name, which is brought forward onto the stage. Um, and then we acknowledge and thank the emergency services and those involved in post-accident care and recovery. Um, and then we also relay important road safety messages. And last year we introduced the Cantu Road Trauma Awards. Uh, we have, uh, it's really privileged to be able to announce each deserving recipient. Um, these are like Cantu Road Trauma Award for public service, uh, community service and road trauma prevention. Um, and so the official partners um, and uh, well-supported um, partners of the trust are Police, Fire and Emergency, St John, Air Rescue Trust, um, NZTA, the Kentu District Health Board. Um, I feel like I've missed someone. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so we've been very privileged um, to have such um, endorsement and support within the sector. And um, yeah, we just would really encourage you to attend and, um, and show your support. And, um, to those particularly deeply affected, um, and probably not many people. No, I'm not really a public. Try to talk publicly about why I started the trust, or 
the Remembrance Day, but I was actually a survivor of two serious car accidents in my early 20s, and one I was like, you know, very close to <laughs> significant like trauma, like um, in a very serious accident. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was just really, um, founding the trust was really to be able to cre create a platform for those deeply suffering in our community and, and obviously providing a voice for those deeply affected. So, yeah, so it's just really a privilege to be able to provide the opportunity to those and particularly somebody that my disheartened 20 year old self would have been privileged to attend. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so just thank you for your support and thank you for having us. And thank you. Aaron, there's a little bit of time here, so I'll just, yeah, Aaron, please. Yes, so thank you, Sarah, for your work that you and the, the Trust do in supporting those families. Um, it's an incredible day. Um, I've been invited along each year. Um, I've had the privilege of being the MC for your event for a couple of years. And uh, the stories that you take away every year from people that get up and speak, I always find incredibly touching and quite moving. And uh, Aaron Hames, who everyone here will know from the council, was there last year. And he said it was, uh, he didn't think there was a dry eye in the house when he was hearing the stories. And he was of a belief that everyone that works in traffic, i.e. those that plan and make roads or make decisions around them, should attend this event because that's the reason why they do work, do their work. Um, and for those that don't know, the f two years ago when I went, um, 38 people died on the roads in Canterbury. Last year we were 40... Uh, oh, last year it was 48. And 48. This year, this year we're up to... 56, yeah. 56. So, so it's a trend that's going in the wrong direction. Um, and when the new government come in a year ago, they promised to do something about it. We haven't seen that yet. Or we haven't seen the outcomes of what they've promised to do yet. Um, and uh, so uh, deaths on Canterbury Roads are going absolutely in the wrong direction and it affects a lot of people and seeing their parents at this event and uh, their friends and family is, is pretty um, disheartening, actually. Um, it'll be great to have an event one year where Sarah turns up and her supporters and no one else comes because no families have lost anyone on our roads. So I look forward to that day. Mm. Well, look, thank you very much and, um, you know, good luck. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to be out of town um, on, on that weekend um, uh, with friends in Auckland, so I'm, I, I am sorry I would be there otherwise. No, but I know Councillor yeah. Anne Galloway yeah, is going to go so as well. And, yeah. you know, and Aaron, you've just got a tremendous supporter. and. Um, you know, we thank you for what you're doing. It is important to 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 honour those, um, not not just those whose lives have been lost, but actually also to honour those that that work. Um, you know, turning up to a traffic accident or crash. Sorry, we don't use the word accident. Um, turning up to crashes is is probably one of the hardest jobs that we ask people to do for us as a community and um, you acknowledge and honour them as well. And it's the same for those that work in the emergency services in every respect, from the ambulances right through to the hospital specialists. Um, it's, such a, it's such a challenging area of work. And, and so many of them have expressed to me about the tragic waste of life um, and uh, avoidable, avoidable. So thank you for what you're doing. It's important that we remember, so thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have any deputations by appointment, we have no petitions, um, and so I'd like to move that the supplementary reports be included in the meeting agenda, seconded by Andrew, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye, aye. those opposed say no, that's carried. I'll move the council um, minutes, Seconded by Tim. <laughs> See, I caught you. I caught you by surprise. Um, and uh, 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 um, yeah, so I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And if we just change the order of the agenda just a, a smidgen, and could I invite um, Ivan Yafeta and Jason Rivett to come forward for? Um, the review of the quarterly performance for Regenerate Christchurch. Thank you. W would you like to make a, a short presentation before I open it up for questions? Sure. I might just make a few opening comments if that's okay. That's fine. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mia. Uh, so I'll take the uh, quarterly performance report as read. I suppose a couple of key points just to highlight. 
uh, as noted in the report, uh, before the end of June, we completed the exhibition for the Otakara Avon River Corridor, which was the last public, uh, significant public engagement step before finalising the plan. Uh, we were pleased to be able to provide the Council with our advice to increase momentum and support regeneration in the central city, which has led to the development of a central city revitalisation action plan, which is being led by the Christchurch City Council. Uh, we completed phase one of the uh, planning for a regeneration strategy for South Shore and South New Brighton, and we're very pleased to have the How team develop an engagement plan, uh, which we're now following. Uh, we completed the long-term vision for Cathedral Square, and that was published uh, in June. And we also completed an assessment and provided a recommendation uh, to the Minister, Minister Mahuta, on the Council's Section 71 proposal for the Yieldhurst uh, Sports Limited uh, facility. Uh, since the report, uh, we have uh, responded to the Council's uh, desire for us to accelerate delivery of the Otakara Avon River Corridor Regeneration Plan, and we've brought forward the time frame for engaging with Section 29 parties. And I'd like to thank the Council for acting promptly and for providing us with the views on the plan, which we expect to finalise within coming weeks. The next step is for us to publicly notify the plan, uh, which is a formality step uh, before we submit the uh, plan to Otakaro, which we expect to do uh, in the beginning of 2019, and then we are looking to provide that to the Minister for approval. Uh, as the, we start nearing finalisation of the plan, an important aspect to ensure momentum uh, for the River Corridor area will be for decisions to be made on future governance and ownership and decisions regarding implementation entities. Uh, and I look forward to the Council and the Crown uh, completing those conversations so that there is greater certainty for the implementation and delivery of work in that area. Uh, we've also subsequently provided uh, our advice uh, to mitigate the short to medium term risks and challenges presented in Cathedral Square. That was provided to the, uh, sh our shareholders at the end of September. We're currently working with your officials to arrange a briefing for councillors uh, along with council staff. Uh, and uh, the Central City Action Plan Group, the chief executives across uh, the various organisations, will then consider those recommendations and uh, how they might be incorporated into the Central City Action Plan. Uh, Coastal Futures Hub was opened at 82 Estuary Road. Uh, we've had good feedback from the community about having a local presence within South Shore and South New Brighton uh, ahead of uh, preparing for Phase 2 for the regeneration strategy. Uh, and we have also received and wish to acknowledge the work of the Council uh, in moving quickly to prepare a Section 71 proposal uh, to, uh, in relation to the residential unit overlay for South Shore and South New Brighton. Uh, the Board of Regenerate Christchurch considered that proposal favourably yesterday, uh, and as per the request from the Council, we'll be providing a response to the Council today within the seven days as requested. Brilliant. That makes me very happy. Um, actually picking up on that um, last um, area rather than the specific issue, um, I'd like just to, just to explore a little bit more about the How Team's uh, reaction, um, well, work that they're doing around adaptive um, management planning because, you know, we, we, we're confronted obviously with um, coastal environments everywhere in New Zealand, um, it's, it's who we are. Um, as a country, and uh, I'm I'm hoping that out of that process of the how team and and um, engaging with the community about how to engage with them um, over something that has uh, certainty, but no certainty around timing or impact, um, and how how we are going to get to a point where potentially we could develop a world-leading um, mechanism for engaging coastal communities in, in that um, uncertain environment. And I agree and completely endorse uh, your comments, Mia. The work of the How team uh, and their advice regarding engagement with that community I think was an extremely valuable step. Uh, it certainly provided us with a greater level of understanding of how to effectively engage with that particular community in a way that we would not have otherwise thought of ourselves. I think you're absolutely right. There are a number of questions about timing of potential impacts of hazards. And I think rather than focus on the timing of uh, what may or may not happen within those timeframes, 
a more constructive conversation as per the Ministry for the Environment's guidelines in developing an adaptive management strategy is to focus on uh, scenarios rather than timeframes and identify key triggers so that the planning occurs on an if something happens, or when something happens basis. Work, uh, the work that we've done with the community has been to identify the appropriate actions that could be considered at that point in time, rather than worrying about whether it's in 10 years, 30 years, or in 50 years' time. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dion, was that you with the hand up? Yeah. Yep. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's cool to see that the um, Avon or Takadai uh, River Corridor strategy thing will be coming out um, mid next month. But it, I saw that it, I, no, well, sorry, I noticed that it uh, finishes in mid December. Is there any chance that that could roll through over the Christmas period and give people a really good time to sort of, you know, there's nobody going to be working, so to speak, in that time? Um, does it have to close in mid December? Look, that's something that we uh, at Regenerate Christchurch and the board considered uh, quite uh, deeply. Uh, what we're trying to balance is the call from the community for progress to be made. Uh, and originally we had set out in the outline a time period without knowing where we might get to by this uh, stage of developing the plan. What we've ob since observed, uh, and based on those observations, I think we should always review uh, whether the remaining program is relevant or, or could be enhanced, uh, is a consistent convergence around key themes. Uh, and those key themes have been around uh, improving water quality, uh, the opportunity to provide ecological restoration, uh, to provide for greater levels of community connection uh, and uh, open opportunities and access for recreation and sport. Uh, there hasn't been a divergence from those themes, a strong divergence from those themes throughout the development of the plan through all of the engagement that we've undertaken. Uh, and so what we're intending to do is ensure that people are aware of what the engagement period is so that they can prepare for that. Five weeks is still a significant period of time for people to engage. Uh, and if we were to uh, extend it over the Christmas period, uh, yeah, there, are, there, there has been uh, previous feedback where engagement has occurred over that period, requesting that it doesn't occur because it's actually a time for people not to be focusing on those things and be, to be spending time with their family and friends. So we think that five weeks is a significant period of time. We think if we let people know early enough that that's the period of time that the uh, draft plan is going to be available for draft comment, uh, for comment, it does then enable us to accelerate the delivery of the plan immediately after Christmas and get it to the Minister for approval. Within the Act, it does recognise or which days of the year can be counted as working days. Mm. And so if we do extend over Christmas, it does actually push the, top, push the time frame out uh, quite significantly for us in terms of delivering the plan. Okay, and I've just got one more um, yep. quer query about the, uh, the budget for the Central City Momentum of 450000 What was What was involved in that specific bit of work from Region for that amount of money? Sure. So... Uh, the organisation has primarily been focused uh, on delivery of the Otakaro Avon River Corridor Plan. Uh, in order to uh, deliver the central city momentum advice, which was always a uh, an expectation from our shareholders, uh, and, and acknowledging that and trying to ensure that we delivered that before the end of the previous financial year, that required us to bring on board some additional ca capacity and capability to ensure that uh, we weren't distracted from the work, that the necessary work required for the Avon Otakaro River Corridor. So primarily it was around additional uh, expertise and capability for us to be able to ensure that we could deliver a qu quality advice for the council while still continuing to progress and accelerate the uh, Otakaro Avon River Corridor Regeneration Plan. Okay. Yeah, no, it's very good advice too, thank you. Um, Glenn? Thank you, and my questions were around the, a little bit similar to Dion's, it's mainly in the report trying to interpret on page 108 the mix of green and amber. So I think what you just said, Ivan, is um, you know it's presented in the diagram as if you go literally on the colour coding as at risk. Uh, what you're saying is, and and the letter of expectation says December this year. So what you're saying is it actually will spill over into January. So where it says at risk, are you what, don't take that to heart too much or. Uh, what I would say is that this is the Council and DPMC's yeah. report. Yeah. Uh, what we have done is work with uh, Council and DPM staff to determine uh, what can be delivered by the end of the year yep. uh, and how we can accelerate the delivery of the plan as much as possible. Right. Uh, there are a small range of options to deliver the plan to the 
minister by the end of this year. Uh, one of those options is not to uh, is to reduce the period by which the Section 29 parties provide views. So we could have asked you to provide views on this uh, within a much shorter time frame. Uh, equally, we could have reduced the public notification period uh, even more substantially. But on balance, we didn't think that those were the right things to do. So what that results in is completion of the public notification period this side of Christmas. We will be working over Christmas, uh, and we will get it, be providing the draft plan to Otakaro for consent. We've been working through, working with them uh, consistently throughout the development of the plan to ensure that when they do receive the plan, uh, that they will be able to provide their consent quickly, and then we will be providing it to the minister as quickly as possible. Okay. All right. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Right. Well, I'll move that the report be received. Do I have a seconder? Tim? I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Yes. We look forward to seeing you on the cathedral. Is it? Cathedral Square. You're coming to see us? Yep. yep. Uh, Christchurch City Holdings Annual Report 2017-18. Um, Raf, would you like to chair this part of the meeting? Um, sure. Well, we had this report presented to uh, Finance and Performance. Um, I'll take it as read. Um, Liz here, if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. Don't look at me. Yeah. All right. Yeah, just at the <laughs> <laughs> ROE for LPC, Raf. Page 117 being so low, and I know it talks about the uh, strike action, etc., industrial action, but have you got a sense of that being higher in the next financial year? I know they're talking about container volumes, etc., being greater, but what's your sense of that? Yeah, I mean, they're still working through growth, um, and, and don't forget they're still doing big development, so their debt. Is also will start increasing. Um, they've been in that situation where they've had this cash settlement, so they haven't had interest costs and so forth. So their, their expenses are going to go up as they start their big projects. Obviously, the cruise booth piling and stuff is happening. Um, so in the next year, their debt levels will go up, which means they'll have higher costs because they'll have interest to pay on that. Um, so we will continue. We're still working with them, but yes, there is growth as we go through the process. But noting they have got some big development programs in front of them. Phil? Thanks, Leah. Oh, um, just mm. on the Enable report, yes. I just noticed that they, they've um, done well and that they've uh, achieved their targets ahead of time, 18 months ahead for their communal network. But I just wondered, do um, the DCL get reports, say, on the N in number of transgressions where, for example, in doing in the uh, with the enable work being done, that some um, some water supply lines were actually um, hit and needed to be fixed. And anecdotally, that se seems to have been quite quite a few reports to myself. That's all. Reports in regards to um, well, that when the enable um, line was going in, yep. th that a number of, a number of other uh, services were actually. Um, impaired in the process. And I'm just wondering, did did um, did Christchurch City Holdings get get re get reports on, on that and how that's being addressed? No, we wouldn't have got reports on that um, on the basis that it would be operational. So that mm. would be managed by Enable itself. Um, so we dealt with if we heard issues like that we had, um, I think it was a year ago, we got feedback that uh, was more things like um, Enable's just come and built, um, you know, dug up their thing, and then councils a week later or two, a month later. So we dealt with all those sorts of things at that high level. But in regards to things, what you were talking about, it is an operational thing that the, the Enable board would look after. So for that to be addressed, we need to hear from Enable in relation to that. Yep, I can ask them back. But noting that the fibre, the build is complete, yep. so there would be no more um, going forward. Um, but we can, I can ask. But there may well still be some repairs to be done. If the reports I'm getting are correct. Okay. Thank fine. you. So, Tim? At some stage, to get a really good idea of 
where they see that going in the future because we know that the construction in industry has tight margins. There are some very good players as well as some very loose players. They're just, a, I guess, a, a long strategy of their vision for the future on that. Sure, I can um, note on that. One thing you need to remember with the construction side of it is it's more um, they do it in conjunction with the rest of their business. So if a client wants construction done, they'll do it. They're not necessarily targeting competing with some of the big construction but, but companies. But that's never guaranteed. So and obviously right. it's, uh, there, is some, there are some issues there, and we're good to know those, because um, the vision and the plan in, a, in any business plan are relevant, whether it's City Care or anyone else, the, the difference between your vision and reality can kind of vary. So just to be good to see how that's going. Yep, I can Thank get you. the feedback on that. Mm. I mean, would we get that kind of information when you come and do the briefing for councillors? Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that or, um, or give some feedback in the next quarterly report, which will be next month. Correct. Yeah, any other Good questions? Good point, Vicky. AGM is on Friday too, that you're more than welcome to come. Oh, okay. Right, I'm happy to move the report. Um, do I have a seconder? Second to Dion, put the motion. All in favour say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. Um, the next item on the agenda is um, policy and practices, Section 10A, the Requirement Dog Control Act. I think I overlooked that earlier. Jamie, did this go through your committee? Uh, yes, it did. Right. Would you like to introduce the item? Uh, sure, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, annually we just have to provide a report to Local Government New Zealand uh, around dog control. That's been done here, so we can take it as read, but Mark's here to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you. Any questions? Bill. Thanks for your report, Mark. Um, I just noticed a, a huge number of complaints received to around dogs, and uh, just re reading recently, uh, ar around the really, um, in terms of survey done, a really small number of owners who actually regularly exercise their dogs. And I'm just wondering, is that is that something that perhaps as a council we could be proactive on in terms of encouraging all dog owners to exercise their dogs? Oh, absolutely. And I, our primary focus is obviously obviously the community safety, mm. but we need to engage with uh, dog owners to educate them to make sure that they do provide the the necessary means to have a dog. Uh, exercise them, feeding them, care for them, all those sort of responsibilities. That's a focus of, of the team going forward in the next 10 years, I suspect, and it's been that, that way for, for since I've known it, really. And, and I guess, Mark, g given that Council have a lot of different promotions, but g given the, I guess, the concerns that are raised, and, and not all about safety, as you say, is, is that something perhaps we as a city, in your view, would benefit from by having a special promotion about good dog care and looking after your dog? A special promotion? That's a very good question. We have a really strong education um, policy. Uh, we visit schools every week in terms of providing children with the right tools to care for themselves when they're out in the public and having to be confronted with dogs that are aggressive. That's a, a, a policy that, or it's a program called uh, Dog Smart. We also have one that uh, focuses on caring for individual people going onto properties. Uh, education to me is the key aspect of it is getting to people to understand the the roles and responsibilities they have and what the sort of impacts that dogs can have in the community and they can have a large impact on people if they're not controlled properly. Um, Pauline? Can I just follow up on that please because um, I when my kids were at school um, I attended one of the dog smart um, programs in there and it was fantastic really excellent and the kids are just so absorbed in it and they really learn some valuable lessons on how, how to approach a dog, how to be safe, how to respect the dog and a bit of understanding a dog's behaviour. I think what Phil's um, implying is could we build on that because the best way to bring um, you know, behaviour changes and good practices is through the children when they're young um, and could we broaden that out into actually caring for your dog at home, what they need to make them healthy and happy. Because often, if a dog's unhappy, chained up all day, it might be cranky and stuff like that. So, um, you know, in, including diet, exercise, affection, time, all those requirements that people don't necessarily think about before they get a dog. So, would that be yes. a, a thing to perhaps build on? First of all, thank you for your comments, and yes, you did right. Um, our investment into children uh, in schools is probably the most important thing we have. 
because they become dog owners and they understand the rules and the right things to do when they're adults and when they're dog owners. It's very important in the development of the children's life and the life and the development of the dog. Um, we hope that most of our dog owners in the future will be better people. We won't have, I mean, we don't like to see any attacks on any people, on any animals. And so our focus needs to be getting those children to understand there's a long-term commitment in owning a dog, there's a responsibility when you have a dog, and it's up to you to make sure the community's safe. And that's how we get it. So I think there's an opportunity for us to add to the value of that uh, in terms of advertising it further in the community, um, potentially on uh, dog day outs and things that we do as well, which are fun days for people to get around and take their dogs for walks and understand that, you know, there are, to be fair, that this community is uh, 95, 99 per cent of the dog owners in the city are great people. <coughs> They're really great people. And they care about the animals, they care about what they do. We just have that, you know, that group of people who just don't want to listen, don't want to understand. Yep. Um, Aaron? Yes, so those 1% um, is, well, might, they might be slightly higher than that, but it's a smaller. Why do we not ban them for good from owning animals? Because they're just so terrible at it. And then also around the, um, the dog bites and attacks, I did a bit of mystery shopping myself this year on that one, so no, well. The, um, and a lot of people think that dog gets put down when that happens, and it doesn't, um, as you know. Uh, but the, why is the owner not then charged with like assault with a dog? That's a good question. Because um, I think I'd rather be punched in the head next time than bitten by a dog, just quite. <laughs> yes. Oh, the yeah. poor. Be careful what you this. wish for. <laughs> and the dog bites all right at the time. It's three days later when the infection kicks in that makes you wince. Yes, that's right. But th th these are matters for the criminal. Um, that's the, legislation. The criminal, the central yes. government. Oh, no. That's the difficulty of getting them into court and prosecuting yeah. them because yeah. the judge is the only one that can actually lay, uh, well, actually ask for the destruction of the dog. I mean, Most people do that voluntarily. In, that. in context, we've got 38,500 licensed or registered dogs. Mm. We've had three prosecutions, so that sort of kind of indicates. <laughs> in saying that, though, we do have a number of dogs that are classified as dangerous and menacing, so there's action taken on those owners, and that's long-term action for them. Um, there are impacts on those financially. There's impacts on them on the dogs in terms of having to wear muzzles and the like. So, um, but a lot of these cases too, we don't get to see the offending dog. They're usually yeah, gone. Exactly. Um, it is about education. Yeah, I, education. I strongly yeah. agree with that. Mm. Rap? Yeah. I mean, look. I mean, poor Aaron um, didn't look too good on his leg but I mean what I notice in, in the areas that I go around in, in you know the parks and the beaches is that people really are pretty slack they let their dogs run all yeah. over the place mm. and they don't care mm. about the interactions with people yes. who might not like dogs rushing up to them uh, I mean can we do more about actually having you know dog control officers who go out and get down to the beach at busy times and just remind people, almost like every year, it's like people need a reminder. We've had fantastic weather recently, you go down to the beaches, but there are dogs everywhere. That's right. You know, and it's like these beaches are for people first, yes, and the correct. dogs seem to take precedent. So our area of prohibitation commences on the 1st of November to the 31st of uh, March, and so we have uh, two full-time officers on the beaches from that date. So dogs are essentially out on the beaches in that area, uh, beyond that area, um, but they still need to be under control, and that's the key to it. Yeah, and a lot of them control. aren't. Oh, they're just they're right. not under control. Yeah. And we, we need to be down there um, enforcing those um, those issues with those dog owners. Yeah. Well, I know that, I mean, I quite often go and stay in the Coromandel over Christmas, and they they have, um, people are, dogs are allowed to be on the beach um, mm. before 9 o'clock in the morning that's and right. after, you know, sort of 5 o'clock in the evening. Um, you know, running free. Otherwise, yes. they have to be on a on a leash. Um, but, I mean, the, the sense I get, and you know, dealing with um, with people who have suffered dog bites by a neighbour, it's very difficult. It seems like stuff's weighted on behalf of the dog and not the citizen, which mm. you know yes. does worry me a little bit. I mean, yeah, dogs are nice and all that, and well-behaved ones, but you know, they are a bit of a menace. And looking at some of these numbers, mm. you know, there's a lot of people impacted by this. But this one is an annual report, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing a number of people putting their hands up, wanting to get involved in the next rewrite of the bylaw. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> David. 
probably going to speak more in support of the um, the dog rangers as someone that's at the beach very frequently, several days a week, and over the summer months, yeah, our rangers are there every day. And, but we do have a problem, I suppose, in, in terms of the metropolitan beachfront that it extends essentially from Spencer Park right down to South Brighton. It's a yeah. huge area. It is. And, and look, um, up in, in the period from the 31st of March to the 1st of November, people are allowed mm. to have their dogs on the beach. They are still required to, to have them under control, but then we get to the 1st of November and they're not supposed to be within the uh, patrolled areas of the surf clubs. Mm -hmm. And it takes a while to sort of get that educative role going. Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say, I think in, in the last couple of years, I've noticed an improvement in, in the attitude of a lot of dog owners during the, the official summer months. Mm -hmm. um, but it is difficult, I think, with the, the extent that we're, we're of coastline that we're monitoring uh, to to get um, that sort of behaviour active all year round. So Let's I, I think we're working in the right direction, but yes. it is a huge area to uh, control, and um, I think behaviours generally are improving, but unfortunately um, I haven't heard too many incidences on the beach of people getting um, bitten but it's more often a bigger dog having a go at a little dog yeah and that's the problems we've probably had more of on the beach rather than um dogs attacking human beings but um i think we're going in the right track there um andrew thank you thank you um so just on the numbers this is on the um in the table on page um 60. Um, clearly, you know, a, a number of complaints there, 9,633 um, dogs that bark, roamed, fouled, um, and so on, um, results in a relatively small number of infringement notices and, by comparison, a tiny number of um, prosecutions. Is that because a large number of those complaints are, for example, barking that would result in a visit from your team that would just resolve that by way of a conversation? Or is it because bringing infringements is difficult or that things are difficult to prove? Or it might be good just to get a bit of background on you know, what looks like a, a large number of complaints results in a relatively small number of um, actions taken or ability to actually do anything meaningful about that? Yeah, the, the, this is the annual report that just states what's happened. I mean, I'd really like this to go back to the committee for yeah. those sorts of questions. I don't, I don't think that um, we're necessarily going to take up the full time of the council just um, getting reports on, on those sort of things. I, I, I really think that the committee could follow up on, on those issues. Um, with a little bit more of a teasing out of some of these issues, would that be all right? Absolutely, and, and you know it should go the same. But all um, all councillors are obviously invited to all committee meetings, so if they want to drill into something, you know, that's a good place for it. Um, yeah. And I'm happy to move in any case the receipt okay. of the report. So you'll move the receipt of the report. Yep, seconded by Anne. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you, councillors. The next item on the agenda is the um, Spire Sculpture Licence to Occupy. Um, just suggested a, um, an additional uh, um, amendment to it, which is um, asking um, staff to provide an update on the Art River Trail, it's called, um, and whether the Spire Sculpture can be incorporated into it. Um, we were asking a question as to whether um, we had to uh, have this expiry date. I mean, we all love it, so um, and want to facilitate its um, its staying there. But as we understand it, it's covered by a um, time limit because of the Reserves Act. Is that right? That's correct, and it would res um, require a resource consent for it to be there permanently. Which well, is possibly something that can be worked through, but at this stage we've been asked to get a one-year extension. Right. Mr. Dawson was looking at relocating it elsewhere. Right. But I'm sure he'd be open to discussions if that was the desire. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, David? I noticed the original licence expired in 2016. How come we're in 2018 now dealing with it? A clerical error. So a clerical it, error? It's, so it's uh, a mistake the, in the date or...? No. Because that would be a clerical <laughs> error. <laughs> if somebody's overlooked um, updating the reserve consent, it might be just a good idea to say that. It, no, no. The um, expiry date wasn't put in to our system that advises us. Oh. So then when we picked it up, it was like, well, this is expired. We need to get this into place. So, so yeah, but in the meantime... Yeah, we have a system and, and it didn't, it didn't have a... It didn't have the event that said that this license had expired. So, you know, staff work through their leases and licenses. We get advised when things expire. Right. This one didn't have that expiry date in there. So it just continued to roll. Okay. Um, Tim and then Dion. Thank you. Take, taking the purchase and ownership out of it, because that has not been discussed at all yet, is it possible to extend... The, the, because Mr Dawson's looking at options as well, I presume, what he's saying that he's got to put it somewhere else. Is it, can we just extend this for a period of time? Is there any issue with that? So, would, because when you sat down, you talked about um, the ownership and permanent, but if we say, well, actually, that's a different conversation, all we're looking at doing, perhaps, is extending it for a period of time. Is that a simple thing to do? This is, is this is extending it for till the yep. end of 2019. So that's what, what we, yeah. So yep. there's no other issue. So that no. should be able just to be done. Yep. yep. Unless Mr. Dawson decides to re remove it earlier, which is his prerogative. Great. I've got, I've got no problem with this. At all. Yeah. I just I actually wanted to expand on that, given that we're re doing the or re granting the permission. Can we do another five year period? Well, just, just to give a bit more certainty to the thing while, while other stuff are sorted out. He, he does actually have, uh, on one of the websites, he does actually have the sculpture for sale, so... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I know so that. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's like... Uh, he's looking for yeah. somebody who will he, keep it in Christchurch. He's, I mean, asked, he's asked to be extended for that period at this point, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been in contact with someone who said, you know, they're happy to give a bit more certainty to it. Um, so, I mean, I'm just asking the question... Given that we're re-granting this licence or this permission, can we extend it for another five-year period under the Act? We can. We can look at that at the moment. No, but we can. We can report back to the council if that's a desire, and we can work through the Reserves Act and resource consents and oh, no, no, all no, no, of no. those issues and bring that back to the council with a further term. At this point in time, the report was prepared for a one-year extension to allow Mr. Dawson time to find a purchaser and to relocate the sculpture. But I'm asking around the permissions that we need under the Reserves Act. So, I mean, the initial permission was five years under the Reserve Act, is that right? Because it, but without resource consent. So if we're re-granting that, can we then give permission for another five years, in theory? I would have to come back to you on that. At this point in time, it's for well, the one-year license. For the I'm happy to move this as, as, as it is. Yep, yep, no, that's fine. Um, and are you happy for the request to staff to provide an update on the Art River Trail and whether the spa sculpture can be incorporated into it? Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, okay. So do I have a seconder? <laughs> no? <laughs> Phil? I said I would second. You'll second it, right, okay. Um, so, uh, is there any discussion on that? I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. We do love the sculpture, by the way. It's I don't fantastic. buy it every night. Um, right. The uh, next item is the Art and Public Places installation of artwork in Christchurch Botanic Gardens. Another sculpture that I love. Um, okay, so I guess the, the, the main question that um, we have around this is in relation to operational costs that um, need to be potentially included in the, in the draft um, annual plan. In terms of the um, agreement to the um, permanent installation, at what point do the, does the obligation around 
um, operational cost transfer, or do we already hold those operational costs? So, so we've already been maintaining it. And right. What we've done <coughs> in the meantime um, is basically we've cut our cloth to suit, and we've, I guess, pulled back a little bit on some of the other art features um, around the city, just to so that we can do a, a level of maintenance on it. Um, uh, water blasting it down, that sort of stuff. It's not ideal. That's why we're raising it as an issue uh, in the annual plan to say if we keep getting these things, which everybody loves, there is a small cost, and we're, we've got that all detailed out. It's it's we just have to um, cut back on other things. Yeah, it seemed yeah. like a lot. Yeah, it's it get, has to get regularly washed down. It's just it's just what it is. Um, this is what's going to happen when the. Um the terraces get transferred, or the promenade um, gets transferred to the council as well. Yes, How, although, although with the with the it needs to be water blasted most days, doesn't it? Yes, but we a number of years ago we did allow for um, that extra funding for taking that on, and that's already in the budgets for especially for the the parks area. That's where that's why we're doing it with our central city crew now. Uh, but but it, it will it will continue because there are another uh, three to four artworks that I know of coming um, that will require maintenance as well. So it's just, it's we have to raise the issue each time to say there is a cost with this. Yeah, no, I yeah. understand. Yeah. And it just did seem to be a particularly high cost. Mm. Um, and what you've said is that it's, it's because of the water blasting it's, that it's, it requires. It's the washing down and because it's in a lake, it's not that easy to get to. Um, um, so it's just really one of those things. Some of the other artworks that go and don't require the same no. maintenance. So yeah. it swings and roundabouts. Swings and roundabouts. Yeah. Uh, Tim. Thank you. Look, I think we've really got to be very clear that These we are looking that at that nowhere. artwork and coming to us because you know, coming to us is a gift. It's actually can and sometimes be a poison chalice. So I think, you know, we... we oh, well, oh, oh, don't I, mention the chalice. Don't mention the chalice. <laughs> <laughs> But I do think that, well, you know, that's, yeah, that's just a whole new bargain. Yeah. But look, I think, do we insist that when these things are proposed to gift to us, as in the city, that we um, insist on the knowledge of or knowing the ongoing costs? Because you've already said that we're reducing services to others. Mm. We just, we're not an endless... Mm. People think this council is a bottomless pit of money, and we are not. Yep. When these come through, we do we ask for quite a lot of information from uh, SCAPE and others, and um, including you know we get the engineering plans, everything, yep. and a full assessment is done of the maintenance costs at the time, and um, as the as the next reports come through via committee, we're going to make sure that we we track that cumulative um, build up of expenditure. When when will we be as a count? When will you or whoever come to us to say that we need more money and a, a cleaning budget for these artworks? Very soon, in the annual okay. plan. Just be aware <laughs> that that money has yeah. to come from somewhere else. So it may be one of your projects or pet projects. The other, the other thing is, with the cleaning of the, um, the Avon precinct, um, we do have the Canadian geese expanding, and so the, the mess that they leave is considerably more than ducks. So just be aware that that is coming, so that will probably blow out that budget too. Glenn. Thank you. I, I guess in terms of cleaning, we, we're talking about things you know, like bird poo. So how does this differ in terms of um, other structures, say um, at Coors Reach or, or the Mayor's just mentioned the terraces or other places where you know there's bird poo. Why would this have a higher priority when we? Well, sometimes with the artwork, it's it's just the the methodology that's a wee bit different because you don't want to damage the artwork itself. So you can't just stand on the bank and blast from there. Um, <laughs> so, some of the some of the other things like the bird poo, where you've got stone paving like through the central city here. Um, it, you know, you can do it a bit more efficiently, I guess, but we just have to be a wee bit careful with the with the fabric of the artwork itself. I think that's it. Th those other those other areas you're talking about, like the jetties and what have you, still need to be cleaned under the the maintenance contract. Because it's art, uh, this takes it up in terms of priority, as um, opposed to. 
not necessarily priority, but in terms of, I guess, the way that the work is carried out, we just have to be a bit more careful. I mean, some of these things are worth quite a bit of money, and yeah. um, if yeah. you let them deteriorate, then you lose the part of the value of the artwork itself. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Brie. Oh, sorry, Anne. Thanks, Brent. Just um, with the report that's coming, um, will that include some of the um, other options in, in terms of models of how we could fund this, rather than the council funding this? Could there be other options um, presented, for example, developers um, and as part of their, um, uh, you know, a gift back to the city? In, in terms of of the capital cost, yes, that's often the case. The, uh, often these artworks are gifted anyway. It's the operational cost. It's the ongoing uh, one that's really our problem. Um, and we can, if, if subdivisions, for example, haven't been handed over, sometimes if there's artworks going in, then they will look after it for the period of the development of the subdivision. But it's really the, the ongoing legacy of these things that we're talking about. So could there be an opportunity to have some sort of a partnership agreement um, in place so that there's an understanding that there is a responsibility to continue caring for the artwork? Uh, with community groups or that sort of thing potentially um, I guess then you've uh, you've got the you've just got the, the quality uh, control issue there in terms of how how they're looked after um, you can do a lot of damage especially to some of the stones and bronzes and things like that if they're if they're not done carefully by um, very enthusiastic people mm, mm, yeah. mm. Just to follow on from that point, Brent, have we given consideration to just having a dedicated team, like probably a team of two, that just do all our artworks all year round, and so they're the only ones that do it, and they just have the equipment and do it in-house rather than contract any of it out to make it more cost-effective? Currently, given um, the number we yeah, have, some of, some of the minor works I think are picked up by our our. Um, in-house staff, but there is a, a contract out there, um, I'm not sure which contractor it is, and they, they do have a dedicated crew, because the type of cleaning, for example, when you get into the bronzes, mm. we are having to re-wax every few mm. years, that does require expertise and um, and uh, a lot of care, so it's it's something I'll, I'll take back to, um, to the park staff and see how they're going to put that out in the future. Do it going forward, yeah. cool. Thank you. Uh, just one last question, if I may. Just um, in terms of, can you see the the art gallery having a role in this at all? Um, I talk regularly with with Blair, the director, about this, and he's involved with um, with the arts advisory group. And the um, these artworks, when they come through, go go for comment through through PAG as well. So they are involved that way, but generally. The maintaining of the outdoor artworks sits with the parks unit, and the indoor artwork sits with the gallery. So that's that's sort of where the relationship is now. So that's good. So is there a potential for that to perhaps change, and so that they um, they also take responsibility for the uh, outside? You know, given that they're specialists, mm. um, and there is a resource already there, could that be something that we could consider? I'm not sure that. The, the resource they have for the indoor artworks, I'd have to check with Blair, but I'm not sure that's a, a similar sort of resource because you're talking about um, you know, some some of the the artworks and the memorials and the statues are all sort of cared for by the one team currently through through parks and um, yeah, quite different to I think what they're dealing with indoors. But we can have a chat. Yeah. Oh. Oh, happy to move. And Aaron seconded. Any discussion? Yep. Tim? Yeah, look, I think we've got to actually have a. I'm going to be voting against this because I think, not because I'm against it, but because we have to have a real conversation about the maintenance and bringing that up front. So, the, the amount of money that we put aside for public works of art 
a percentage of that should be going to, the, um, first and foremost, to the maintenance of the art we already have. Because if we don't do that, that, but that money will be coming from another budget somewhere else. And we are under pressure. All our budgets are under pressure. We've had NGOs, at the arts organisations and the community all stressing how much they are under pressure and we are reducing funding left, right and centre because of the pressures. So I think we have to have a realistic look at this and understanding of it because I, I do remember the rigmarole of going with the chalice and the stupidity of the process for changing the bulbs and we had to do it. It was just insane. So we've got to be practical about these things. But I will be voting against this because I do need I think we need to force this issue. It is a reality. Thank you. Thank you. I will support this. It is quite striking. Uh, I note the uh, the subject to list, including the additional maintenance costs for consideration in the next annual plan. And on that note, I suggest we also need to consider other things that come under the ambit of your unit, Brent, such as um, potential funding for other places which are important to people, which um, <laughs> we've heard about the terraces, the Kurs Reach pontoon, Anzac Drive, where birds poo over them. It's not good for public use. So I think in all fairness, we need to consider that as well. But on balance, I think it's a magnificent piece of work and <coughs> it will be good. Bill and then Anne. Well, look, um, as chair of the committee who considered this, I'm strongly supporting this. I'm a bit disappointed that some things have been relitigated and some councils are changing their minds, because the key point of this was actually looking at the permanent installation of a really lovely piece of artwork. And people, um, I know when I stop to admire it, lots of others do too. And people will say, look, this is beautiful. And the whole name, Diminish and Ascend, is, I think, quite inspiring and f food for thought. So um, I'm strongly supporting the recommendations. I think it's important that we deal with this today. There are, of course, the maintenance issues which are dealt with in the report. And so, um, yeah, I, I just think it's a pity that, that, in fact, we do need to keep th this, um, this beautiful piece of art. And we've got very good support from SCAPE and others. And we do need to ensure the, ma the maintenance happens. Anne? I'm strongly supporting too, and I, I think it's a, a, we need to have this discussion. We can't, uh, we're not talking about um, you know, uh, a public facility that needs cleaning, for example, you know, I don't know, changing sheds or something. We're talking about art, and we're talking about something that, uh, are, th these things are treasures. So I think we need to perhaps um, elevate the, the, how we see this um, in this discussion, and um, to give them the due um, attention that they deserve. So I look forward to the report and having a further discussion about how we can actually maintain and care for these treasures in our community that are much loved yeah. and bring incredible um, a sense of well-being to, to many people. And also it acknowledges the hard, you know, the value of, of our artists that we care for them and um, also how we see art in, in our community. So I look forward to that report. Thanks, Brent. Right. Pauline? Yeah, just very quickly. I, I'm, I, I just want to support Tim's comments too because that's something we do need to look at whole of life costs when we're gifted or however we obtain any artworks um, and I really fully support that so that we can budget for them appropriately. I think Christchurch is becoming an incredibly artistic city. We're, we're, we're getting on the map for our amazing works that we have here. Um, so, But this one we already have, so to withhold um, or we'll put this at risk, I'm not supporting that at all. So I really do want to support retaining this, but going forward I think Tim's um, argument is strong. Um, and I really support the, um, the meaning behind this, you know, we have to diminish, it's like life, you know, we have to diminish in order to ascend, even if we do get pooped on on the way up. <laughs> All right. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Aye. That's carried. Uh, Tim Scandrit. Um, thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, the draft submission on the building so amendment bill. It's been held up, so can we hold that up and move oh. down to... So what we down to. Oh, sorry. Um, Robert's been held up, so yeah. can we stand you down until Robert gets here? Sure. He may be held up longer than that, so do you want to see if there's questions? Oh, we'll, we'll have...
Robert. Yeah, sorry. I mean, I'm, I've got people talking in my ear. Grab a seat. We'll deal with it without Robert. Although, have you had a chance to talk to him about the issue I raised with you yesterday? I I haven't. I've oh. emailed him the sorry, I mean, of wording at the same time as you, but he hasn't gotten back to me about so, it. So another we can do. Okay. Well, we'll 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 just set it aside just for a minute, and um, sorry, we'll come back to it as soon as Robert's. Um, at least able to respond to the email. Sorry. So uh, I'll just I'll explain to the councillors because it's um, probably a bit unfair. I, I have followed the Building Act changes that are required as a result of the Royal Commission into the collapse of buildings um, after the earthquakes, um, or as a result of the earthquakes. That um, you know I've been following this issue very closely. As a council, we've submitted on all of the changes that have been made. Um, we've taken a very strong uh, stance on earthquake-prone buildings. This, to me, picks up one of the remaining gaps, but it doesn't pick up the other, as the submission um, has highlighted. Uh, there are actually two gaps, and uh, I do want to have advice from our kind of building consents team. Um, Robert Wright has uh, played an exceptional role in ensuring that we're, um, we're making really high quality submissions to Parliament on these matters um, and um, Judith has uh, taken uh, what was my concern and turned it into an addition to the, to, the, um, to the submission. But what I want is to make sure that Robert is kind of on board with that um, because I think that will make the submission more powerful. Um, if he's able to um, provide some advice. So, so we'll just put it to one side until that is the case. But if people are generally comfortable with the direction that things are going, why don't we just resolve um, to accept the uh, draft submission on the Building Amendment Bill um, and delegate the final sign-off to, um, to myself, um, and, then, and, and I'll do that in conjunction with... Um, with Robert and Judith. Yep, you'll move that way. So Phil moves, Aaron seconds. Yep. You'll be submitting in person yourself? Yes. Okay, yeah. Right. So um, resolve that the council be heard at the hearings in support of its submission represented by the Mayor or her delegate. So approve the um, draft submission subject to the final approval being with the Mayor, you know, so and then resolve that I be heard. So that's been moved and seconded. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. You can tell Robert I'll probably free this afternoon and we can catch up then. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, right. So uh, the next item is just a, a noting paper from um, uh, Carleen Edwards. Uh, as you know, uh, she had an obligation to report to the external advisory group. Um, report. She had to report back on that um, by the end of the month. Um, this is the last meeting that is held this month, and of course she's also got now the review into the management of bore water security, the Bruce Robertson report, as it's um, known, and uh, she's going to report on on those as well. Um, even though the first of November um, meeting is a, a, a community board meeting. Uh, I'm very keen to accept those two reports there. I want Carleen at the meeting uh, when we discuss both of them. So, and I think that the Bruce Robertson report will give us an opportunity to consider um, appropriate recommendations for the way forward, um, particularly in relation to returning to chlorine-free status and um, the external, advi external advisory group report uh, will enable us to drill into some of the um, elements that they raise there. So I'll move that we note that these reports will be received at the next meeting, seconded by Pauline. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Uh, the next one is the water supply improvement update and summer conservation. Um, Helen's on her way. Oh, she's on her way. And we haven't got development Christchurch here yet, so, um, well, we've got, we've got morning tea arriving at 11, so, uh, why, why, well, why don't we just adjourn the meeting until 11 o'clock and people can 
um, bring a bring a cuppa back with them. Yep. Okay. Helen, all is forgiven. Uh, I thought I was going to be free to get my coffee, but no. <laughs> right. Helen, would you like to introduce the report? Sure. So this is a, an update report on the water supply improvement programme and as you all know this is about ensuring our water supply is both safe and good to drink. So you'll have um, a couple of appendices to the report this month which are new and they show as we're working through the 53 pump stations how we're reducing the chlorine dose and or removing the chlorine from those pump stations as the wellheads are upgraded and then the second chart that shows the number of wells that have been signed off um, as we progress through that major remediation program. And uh, you may have seen on the news last night that the um, news crews were out at the Grampian site where there's a, uh, a, an above ground wellhead installation being put in as they were there so that was, um, it was good to see the, the real progress. In terms of the alternative disinfection, the design at main pumps has been completed. We're just checking that in-house with our asset management and operations people, and that'll go out to tender next week. We've um, also confirmed the approach for the repairs to below ground wells, and we're seeking secure status for some 46 below ground wells where we have positive artesian pressure. So we have, um, we have mapped out an approach there which means checking the integrity of the well casing, sealing the below ground chambers, putting in backflow and air vents as we would normally, uh, putting in sump pumps and wet floor detectors just in case some water does get into those chambers and having some autom automatic shutoffs. And with um, the addition of more frequent inspections and sanitation of those chambers and a site specific water safety plan, the drinking water assessor has indicated that she will sign those off as meeting the current standards. So um, I hope to be able to update you on the progress of that. We're just getting that work costed at the moment. So we'll be able to update you on that within a month or so. Uh, you will note that we've started to talk about water conservation over the summer period, and that's to enable us to keep working uh, on both the major remediation to bring wellheads above ground and on the works on those below ground wellhead chambers. And our own parks and gardens people will be uh, participating in that conservation campaign and the indications from the survey work that we've done is that residents will also uh, contribute to that campaign and save water. Uh, and finally the report just gives an update on the broader strategic framework for potable water and some of the uh, strategic documents that are either being drafted or almost ready to come to council for confirmation. Happy to take questions. Aaron, Pauline. My first one is um, 2C on our um, thing up there. It says if we, when you're monitoring the consumption, consumption that we would bring in the restrictions of um, handheld hoses between 9pm and 7am on alternate days. Is that back to front? Shouldn't no, it be 9am till 7? No, we want people to water overnight, essentially. So at night after time. 9 o'clock at night and before oh. 7 in the morning. Watering during the day is when we have the problems. Yeah, so, because that, that's not very clear. So it's on alternate days you're allowed to water with a handheld hose mm. at midnight. Indeed, yes. Right. Which 9 p.m. or 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah, so overnight, 7 um, a.m. But the At any time, you don't have to do it all So night. on the other day you're allowed to run your sprinkler full bore? On the other day you're not allowed to run your sprinkler at all. You're not allowed to use the restriction it at all. means no sprinklers. The restriction means no sprinklers whatsoever. Yeah, the okay. level three restriction is no no sprinklers whatsoever. 
Okay, and because we've had a problem in the past that people have often seen this as quite onerous, and then of course there's the attacks on, well, it's, you're letting other people take water, so on and so forth, as you've probably heard them. How We need to make this really clear, the how and why, so people don't get confused, because even I was confused then, um, but, and I think I'm averagely smart. Yes, yeah, so, so this is a very short form of the restrictions just for the purposes of the Council resolution. There will be um, a much broader marketing campaign and communications campaign that sets this out very clearly alongside the water saving tips. Uh, but the key, the key about this is, is inviting the public to come on board with a water safety, water conservation campaign. Mm. That's so exactly if, right. if the public come on board yeah. and want this to happen and want us to continue to working as hard as we possibly can over the summer, then they'll come on board. Yeah. You know, and if they don't come on board, then um, staff will, well, I, I, you know, I'm just wondering whether you should come back to us and ask for permission to introduce level three water restrictions. One of the challenges with that is that we'll have contractors on site and work's underway, and if we can't make a quick decision, we'll actually have to stop the works to keep up with the demand so in the network. My point being is that, for the, and it's the Mayor's point, is that for this to work, the, the public have to be on board and have to completely understand the reason for this. And last year, and we're coming up to the anniversary date, it's five weeks away, is we set a world record for the most water usage of any city of 650 litres for every single person in one day which is insanity when it's the world's best drinking water. It's a 650 litres for every person. It's incredible. And that's coming up, the anniversary. And if we do that this summer, that work can't be done. Yeah, but th th and that's the message that needs to be got yeah, a across, which is why I was kind of disappointed that the headline is restrictions, instead of come on board and save the water, conserve the water, be part of the city that is in this together. Because, I mean, the work needs to be done. Um, how much of it needs to be done um, over the summer? I think we want, we'll, we'll follow that up after the Bruce Robertson report. But, because um, I still have this view that we need to be um, thinking a way more collaboratively with the, um, with the Medical Officer of Health about how we get to a position where we can actually make a decision to take the chlorine out of the water. Um, and I mean the Bruce Robertson report has made it pretty clear to me, and that's why we need the report next week to go through this, that, um, you know, that, that the level of risk is, not, um, is no different than it was last year. David? What we could do is um, we could show on our public website the consumption we need to keep under yep. so people have got a clear picture of are we succeeding as a community collectively um, and then that would actually give you as councillors but also the public out there, hey we're getting up there, that might need to yep. come in. So that might be a way to actually get a better buy-in, a bit like those, you know, just to speedo something or rather. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Pauline and then Phil. Yeah, thank you. Some of my stuff's actually been covered there, but um, and I and I thanks Helen for doing the conducting the survey, which has come out uh, in a very positive response. I believe that people are looks like they're willing to actually embrace this, and um, the people that you've spoken with obviously understood the rationale, which is uh, encouraging for when we put the messages out. Um, so we've actually got to move into. Um, uh, taking people with us and, and perhaps getting some ideas from them as well on how to conserve the water. And um, I think we've got a website, haven't we, WaterWise or something? Um, and I don't know if many people know about that or know how to get to it. But if we could have an interactive thing where people could feed in and give us their ideas on how they're conserving as well. I mean, for example, I'd, and if I'm washing dishes in the sink, I use a a pot or a bowl, and then you can pour that on your plants. I mean, that's the level we have to get to. It's um, like when we were looking at the flooding, we were talking every millimetre counts, every drop counts, every drop. So people realise they've got to do their bit. So if we can perhaps um, get the direction through the website with water saving tips, I think, and allow people to feed into that, do you think that would be possible to build on that? That, that may be possible. Um, we'll have to check, check with our IT people about what sort of interactive website they can set up. 
uh, but it, it certainly is possible. One, one of the things that may assist, and I'll circulate it to all councillors, is that we do have a water conservation campaign mapped out for yes. the summer period, and I can circulate that to you so you can understand what the messaging is, how clear that messaging is, and that we will be focusing on the areas where we are doing work at the time we are doing the works. Yes. So we'll have um, a much more focused and intense campaign where we absolutely need it. Right, we need we good. need citywide savings, there's yep. no doubt about yep. that, yep. but we also need um, a particular focus on some areas when we're doing some work. Yep. And we could put that on Facebook, etc. And the other thing too is um, how long do you envisage those restrictions would be in place till would it be say March, April? March at the latest. It really, uh, it really depends on how hot and dry the summer is. Yeah. So it's a short window of people just to really get on board. Now. Yes. Thank you. All right, uh, Phil, and then Glenn. Thanks for your report, Helen. Um, my question is about the water conservation things too, and just how perhaps we can be proactive um, and, and th through our, pr our promotion programs, like including, for, for example, purchasing people purchasing drought-free plants, so in fact they cope better long term, but also things like the use of mulch and, and things like that. So in fact we're proactive so that people have to use um, water less in the longer term. My other question, Helen, is in relation to um, the financial implications section of your report <coughs> under uh, 5.23 it is. So what we're doing is um, the cost of the physical works currently uh, is going to be around 10 to 50,000 for for each um, bore. But then the f later physical works to raise the bores above to above ground level is a, between another 150 to 350,000 dollars. So I guess my question is, does that mean to, to achieve that state safer water status, we're spending in a, a, a potentially an additional fifty thousand dollars so we can achieve that achieve that water status as soon as possible? Yes, that's absolutely correct. So that ten to fifty thousand for the works to the below ground wars, most of that um, most of that physical work will be replaced when we eventually raise those bores, and we would be proposing to raise those bores within two years. Thank you. Um, Glenn, then Raf. Thank you, Helen. Obviously, you know, we're, we just have to get on and do the work, which is what we're doing. But I'm a little bit curious over a couple of the wellheads on page nine, which I drive past frequently. And I, I saw them, I've seen them worked on in the last few years. They took some time. And I, I'm, can I just ask you when we first began raising below ground wellheads? And I, I'm, I'm asking about the Lake Terrace and the Grampian. Not Grampian, sorry, Lake Terrace and the Hills um, Central Wellheads. Um, I'm particularly thinking of the one in, it's on the bend with Akaroa Street uh, heading. So the, the, work, Road. the work at Hills and Grampian yeah. has been underway for several weeks. So yeah. uh, the end, those ones are both proposed to be finished in November. Right. and. and that along with Lake Terrace, these are new kind of wells. I'm just trying to work out when we uh, first. No, these are, these are not new wells. These are these are existing wells where we're right. um, where we're putting a, a an oversized okay. casing down, putting yeah. a grout seal in, then raising the bore up above ground and replacing yeah. the headworks. I, I'm just curious as to when did we start raising um, well heads because these are quite. New uh, I take your point. Okay, so yeah. since the earthquakes, all, since the all of the new ones since the earthquakes have been above ground. This was I'm already on our. It. This was already on the council agenda before we yeah. were elected. Well, before I was elected, so um, it was pre twenty thirteen that I'm they the decision was taken to put the wellheads over time above ground. What, what we're doing is fast tracking a well, program that was already I don't underway. I think these were done because these were both done post quake. Yeah, no, and now we're going back. But there's fencing around it right now, and there's a new one going to be done at Lake Terrace. And yet, Lake Terrace is quite new. I think the end of the question, we're trying to ask why are these above ground wellheads being worked on? Is that right? Well, they're not because above ground. The Hills Road one is. Yeah. Well, why has it got ground. fencing around it? I so, on you saying yeah, no, that we you, put you, in so below ground wells post earthquake? Yeah. I don't think you? we did. No, I don't think we did. I think we did repair some. 
but I don't think any new wells went in with above ground well heads. But I can check that. But look, we can, yeah. we can check the details. Yeah, that'd but, be good. Um, it's the, yeah, okay. Yep. A decision was taken a, quite a long time ago to put the, gr the well heads above ground, um, but over a very long period of time. Um, uh, Rev? I mean, that, that's an interesting question. And what I was going to ask, really, going back to the data piece, I mean, we've talked about open data for quite a few years here, and I think having um, the ability to give the public a measure of daily water consumption would help. Mm. Um, unfortunately, the only thing that will get people to reduce consumption is pricing water, because there, there's actually no incentive for anyone to limit the amount of water they use. So people who don't use a lot of water get no benefit from that, um, and people who use a lot of water are really not paying for that. So unless we get to the point where there are water shortages, which does get people um, to change. I mean, look at Cape Town, nearly ran out of water a couple of years ago. You know, people immediately cut their consumption. But we're not running out of water. So the incentives to get people to change are quite tricky, but having numbers can be quite good because that mm. does give people something to focus on. Mm. Totally agree. To with. So if we could get that data, I mean, do we have daily data on water consumption? We, we do not call our main pump stations, so we have to work out how to bring it in. It's a little bit more tricky because there's some uh, zones that will be more, um, we'll want to reduce and maintain a low flow where we're doing the work, obviously. So we need, we, we have that data, we bring it in, we get daily consumption, we send that off to ECAN, we get that all, um, that's done. At the moment, it's done uh, well ahead or pump station by pump station. So we'd have to somehow bring it together and just have to talk to our IT people, how I get it out of SCADA and put it into whatever I need to do or they need to do to put it into a speedometer or into a something or other. I think it would be incredibly useful and to have it front facing on our website every day so that people can see what the daily consumption is. You know, and, and, and something to measure against. Is this up or down? At the moment, we know from this report, and you know, this was news, um, was that our consumption rate is higher than it was this time last year. We can't go into summer like that. We have to bring down our consumption rate. And what I want to do is call on the people of Christchurch to get them behind the campaign. It's only so that staff can carry on bringing the wellheads above ground. It's so that they can continue the same rate of work that they've been working on the wellheads um, up until now, right through the summer period. We need people to come on board with a campaign to conserve. We don't want to impose restrictions. It's about people actually having a chance to do something. And, uh, you know, and look, somebody mentioned the, um, the, uh, the, the, the bottling plants, and there are two letters to the editor that's got nothing to do with our supply of water. We do not supply the water. We do not take the water out of the ground for them. They treat the water before they put it into the, into the bottles. It is um, consented by ECAN. It has nothing to do with the Christchurch City Council, and it has nothing to do with the supply of water. But, I mean, is it possible to even have that conversation so that people understand they're two separate things. Yes, so the, the messaging in the water conservation campaign is about the need to take wells and pump stations offline to continue works. Yeah. It's not about a lack of water as no. such. It's about a need to continue repairs to our infrastructure that we use to deliver the water. Right. Uh, and making that clear to people. And right. once you explain that, people do get it. They do understand. Yeah. But I just I, I, I get frustrated because there doesn't seem to be a counter message. You know, it's very easy to say, you know, all these people are taking water. They've got their own bores, they've got their own consents, and it's all done through ECAN. I mean, none of us around this table are particularly happy about circumstances that, that, that um, pre-existed um, in terms of existing consents that are just picked up by people who come in and buy and then um, you know work against what is a, a, a sort of a, a, a global need to deal with plastics I mean for goodness sake but Can it's I... got nothing to do with our water conservation program. So, so just to finish um, what I've said um, you can't manage what you don't measure and yes. you can't expect people to change their behaviours when they don't have the most basic information. Yeah. So if you're not giving them a price signal, you've got to give them a quantity signal. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, it's a really strong point, and I think we, 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 
you're receiving that message loud and clear, Helen. We would like to see that as part of the campaign. On the front page of the Christchurch City Council website, daily consumption rates with a comparison to where we were last year and where we need to be to be able to take um, our wellheads offline to fix them. Dion. Are we still on questions? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I thought. Oh, that was one. <laughs> <laughs> That's my first one. Uh, second question: Is is there any? Re do you know any of the uh, why we're, tra you know, tracking about 20 to 25 percent more consumption of water this year? You know, especially since first of July to now. Uh, over no, the last two years? No, we don't, and we're checking back to see why that is. One of the reasons might be that we've changed which pump stations we're using, and there may be some flow meter data that isn't quite the same. It may be that we're counting another pump station that we weren't counting last year, okay. so we are doing a bit of work on that. Because it is, it is it's quite an anomaly there, so I just wanted to sort of get that clear. Just one thing I'd answer, and this time last year we were coming out of two major floods and this year we are coming out of actually three dry months. And so Helen raised, uh, our biggest challenge will be what the climate will do over the time. And I think you'll see there's a difference in the last three months. We um, have certainly had three months that are drier than the average that we normally have for these three months. Last year we had three months which was off the record books of extraordinarily wet. Mm. And that might not be the main reason, but uh, well, I think that may be but, the main well, reason. I mean, we had. Uh, I mean, yeah. we had. I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily the case because June, remember, was one of the wettest Junes we've ever had, and the, the water table's been higher than it's ever been before. So, I mean, I'm not sure whether that's actually true, um, or with well, the whole case of the thing, maybe. But anyway, the other question I have is, we've got the big commercial users. I remember reading a report sometime. You know, Ansco use a lot of water. The the other, you know, big commercial users. Are we also talking to them? Because, I mean, we're putting a lot of onus on our residents. Are we talking to these big commercial users and saying, actually... If they've got their own boards, Dion, they're not taking no, it out of our system. No, they're taking it out of the take. Of, of, you know, there was a report here. But, but, but that's no, repeating... No, it's the they take a lot that of That is repeating the issue that I've just raised. No, I... So if, if there are big commercial users that are on the city supply, yes. they are getting the price, the price signals that Councillor Manji yeah, they pay. mentioned there. So they are focused on conservation of water. Yes, I know. But there, I mean, we've got some big users that take off the water, the, the city water supply. Yes. Um, I'm just sort of saying, are they getting the same message about reducing their supply, or are they going to be measured at different times? You know, when we've got peak times that residents might be using they, it. They already have that message through the pricing signal. So that, that's, not where, that's not where we see the fluctuations in the summer. The fluctuations in the summer are due to residential use and garden watering. It's not about yeah, industrial and commercial yeah. users. I was just thinking about evening out the flow that's going through the system. But they pay for their water, which we, we, we pay for the system through our rates, but they get a specific price signal around how much they use. All right. Um, Tim and uh, Thank Vicky. Thank you. Just a couple of quick Sorry. questions. First of all, just to clarify, the what are restrictions that we are proposing or that are going to be put in are p not about restricting water because of the reduced the, the re reduced amount of water. It is restricting the use to allow work on our pump stations to get the pump stations above the ground to get to the reduction or the, the um, elimination of chlorine in our water sooner. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. But I, I need to emphasise that the water conservation campaign comes first. So the water conservation messages will go out first. We will use focused messages <coughs> in areas where the demand exceeds what we can supply and continue to do the work. And mm. water restrictions will be a last resort. So the survey indicates that people are willing to conserve water. And yep. so we think that that, that in fact, will, will be so across mm. the city. But the, the, the crux of it is, it is to allow us to do work on the above head, well heads, to get rid of, the, eliminate the chlorine sooner than normal. Because the, there's been a lot of discussion around about the, and concern about restriction of water, etc., because of the, the the lack perhaps of water. But that's oh. not the that's, that's not, not the case. If we if we if we stopped the well head conversion and the um, remediation works, we could supply mm. what the city is demanding over is the it, summer. Okay, because at some some point the process that we use for this would actually be good because at some point in the future there may well be water water issues because of lack of water and that measure 
and that how we show people, and it should be on the face of our, our that should be the first thing on the city council website because mm. it is the most important thing to the city, is that if you are using this much, then we are going to have problems. If you reduce it, because I think what Aaron said, you know, 650 litres per day, per day, that's insane, you know, like, I'm sure I don't use that much, but you know. But yeah, yeah I, I guess, yeah, the question is, we haven't, we're taking an assumption that the people of Christchurch want to restrict, would, would openly restrict water to get rid of chlorine quicker, because we actually haven't gone out and asked anybody. Yes, we have asked them, yeah, and the survey that. results oh, are in the report, okay. and, and people are willing to come on board okay. with that. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Vicky. Uh, so just a couple of things. Uh, the water bottling um, plant, which people will confuse with this, yes. that's coming the, to ITI next meeting, in terms of what we can do by way of responding to the resource consent that's gone into ECAN for that, as I understand it. Um, and then secondly, if people have water tanks, rainwater tanks, I'm assuming then they're free to use that up before they start, um, because it's not impacting on our water Absolutely correct. If people right. have got rainwater tanks, yeah, then there's no restriction an on that use. For them. And then thirdly, on the big picture, so at the end of 12 months in April next year, May the 9th was May when the 9th, we finished right? the temporary coronation programme. <laughs> Date etched in your memory. So May the 9th, um, assuming that the water, the drinking water person will approve the repairs to the, I think you said 46 tanks? Below, 46 below ground well below heads, ground. yes. Does that get us to the point that we want to be at on May the 9th next year? Yes, it should. If all of the other works go to plan and we can do the repairs on those below ground wells, we should be able to provide water to the whole city without chlorine. The, the, um, the slight rider I would put on that before you get too joyful about it uh, <laughs> is that that is, that is during the winter. So yes. that is winter supply and we yes. don't need to have every pump station yes. running. The yeah. challenge would then be the following November. summer, yeah. and that's why we're also still pursuing um, ultraviolet yeah. at, at a number yeah. of other pump stations. Yeah. Thanks, Helen. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, very good. Um, so, um, Raf, you had an um, amendment that you wanted to add to this, um, and that's been moved and seconded. Do you do you just want to? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I'm happy to move it. Yeah, but but I'm just wondering whether you just want to include it in the entire resolution. Yeah, I'm happy to move. You're the You're happy whole to move thing. the whole yeah. thing. So, and you're happy to second the whole thing, Aaron. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay. So, um, is there any is there any discussion about that? Well, if I may. Yep. Yeah. I mean, the re reason I've included it is because I th I do think we need. Um, to understand what those implications are before we make a decision, because we did approve this chlorination program for 12 months. It was approved reluctantly um, and somewhat under duress at the time. And w rather than saying we're going to stop or not stop, I'd like to know what the implications are in terms of whether we believe the, the public health issue is not an issue, which has clearly been the point. Uh, what the reaction would be from the drinking water assessor, what the reaction would be from medical the officer of medical officer of health. So I just want to understand those implications before we start thinking about that decision, because I think it is a decision council will have to approve mm. to extend at some point. Yeah. Pauline. Surely we would not make a decision to remove the chlorine unless the drinking water assessor had indicated that she, in this case, is satisfied that our infrastructure that's, is not the standard. That's this, what surely. this is about, because that yeah. is not the case. Sorry? That is not the case. What do you mean? Well, we, we have only authorised... The reason I'm asking for the implications is because I want to understand the implications without making assumptions as to either what decision we would make or what position different people would have on yeah. it. I, I'm, I'm good with this. Uh, look, we're going to have a bigger debate about this yes. next week yeah. when, the, when, when Carleen Edwards reports on the Bruce Robertson report because that identifies a sequence of events that we haven't debated as a council yet and uh, I want us to debate that 
and uh, I want us to understand what the implications are of that. So I'm quite happy for this one because I think that we'll be reinforcing this but asking a few other questions as a result of the Bruce Robertson report um, uh, when we debate that next week. So um, I'm, I'm really comfortable for this uh, and I think that um, you know, a number of us are going to be having conversations with um, certainly the Medical Officer of Health about um, about that report and how that might uh, feed into the decisions that we need to make. So the, the council staff have no authority to add chlorine in the water beyond um, the, the 12 months uh, from when it was instigated. And, um, and that's the 9th of May, that um, is the date that everyone has etched in their mind. Um, and that does take us into a winter period, which is a good thing because um, it, it does um, it does mean that uh, it gives us a, a lot more time to, to, to continue to work on it. Um, but the other, the other good thing is, is that, um, well, the other thing is, is that I still, I'm still not necessarily convinced that, that without, without having certain conversations, I'm not convinced that we have to um, keep the chlorine in even that long. So, um, but I want to go through all of the issues and understand what all of the issues are, which is why I support the addition of, the, um, of that recommendation. Um, Andrew. Thank you. Um, the answer to Vicky's question um, was particularly encouraging, that we are on track to, to get the chlorine out of the water within the one-year period. Um, I'm certainly supportive of this additional wording. I think we need to be in the best position we can be as we approach consideration of, of how we um, are able to get the chlorine out of the water and we do that confidently. It's right that we should have the best advice and the best information around any decision that we may need to make or the timing of that. Um, but the, the headline message really for me is that I'm, I'm delighted that we've got an improvement program underway which is achieving what we've set out to achieve which is to get the chlorine out of the water within that 12-month um, that period. So, um, yeah, well done, Helen, to, to you and the team for all the work that you're doing. We, we certainly appreciate the, the complicated nature of the work and, and the demands that you're under, and I think you're doing a great job with the team. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I'll just wrap up the debate again, um, saying the same thing, just calling on the people of Christchurch to come on board uh, this is not a, a case of, um, of imposing um, restrictions. This is an opportunity for count, uh, Christchurch residents to, to basically help the team get the boarheads repaired in sufficient time or brought above ground in sufficient time that we can um, continue to reduce the chlorine in the water but at the same time um, aim to get it out of the water altogether um, at, a, at a point that we want to keep it there. And that was my point about the Bruce Robertson report, and I won't rehearse the arguments that I, more than not the, the, the points that I want to make next week, except to say this, that what the Bruce Robertson report was designed to help us understand was not only how to get the chlorine out of the water, but how to keep it that way because we've got central government to also work with um, in terms of some of the agendas that are being promoted um, in that sphere, and that's all I'll say about that today. But thank you, Helen, um, as Andrew has said, uh, to you and all of the team. It's an extraordinary job that you're doing under a considerable amount of pressure, um, and we really appreciate it, and so do the people of Christchurch. Thank you. I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And we will adjourn for a cup of coffee and come back here at, oh, that'll be nice, half past 11.
coverage, which is the item um, is a Development Christchurch Limited Quarterly um, Progress Report. Um, oh, yep, they're already here. Thank you. Hi, very much. Um, thank you. Just a reminder: there's, there's two parts. It's the public part of the report and the yep. PX. So, just talking very briefly to the public part of the report, I've just um, left on the table just a little update picture diagram of uh, work as part of the new Brighton yeah, Fortune okay, Developments, uh, which picks up the, the playground and we had some additional works that are completed uh, recently uh, there. Um, we're just waiting on one surfboard that sits on springs to be installed and then that's fully complete. Uh, we this week have been laying asphalt onto the other side of the pier in the little atrium near the War Memorial, which is having a FIBA qualified half basketball court installed uh, at the moment. And we're just awaiting on uh, finalising the resource consents for the hot pools. Uh, that'll be a 12 month construction period on receipt of all consents. So I'm anticipating commencing uh, groundworks in January. So, uh, so that work is progressing well. So uh, maybe I'll just leave it there for the moment with respect to the public part of the report, unless there are any questions. Uh, Aaron? Yeah, just having watched some of the um, youth games, the World Youth Games that are on at the moment in South America, uh, I think it's Argentina, the, um, and the New Zealanders are, are doing really well. The half basketball is the basketball at the youth games. They don't play full court. They, it's, I think it's a five on five comp. Yeah, the FIBA one is a half court, and this will be FIBA standard. So, so there's an intention to potentially host, host events there. That was my question. Yes. Is that uh, have we looked that far ahead to um, organise some uh, events and make this the premier one, certainly for the South Island, but maybe for New Zealand, like every summer? get a competition going because it's a great amphitheatre there as well for an event. Yep, that, that has been looked at. Great. Yep. Okay, any dates? Uh, no. Not, Not that I'm kind of young enough for anything. <laughs> for a date. Uh, Tim. Thank you. Um, now, look, forgive me if I've, I've got, if we've done this, but a, a, a business plan for the hot pools? Oh, I can't remember seeing one, whether that's in PX or whatever, but yeah, I'm just have we, have we been given one or? Yeah, so there was, uh, the, the original intention was to source um, or, or to investigate sourcing an external operator. The decision yep. has been made that it will be run as a council operated facility. Uh, so that uh, business plan is, um, or, or that operating plan, there's some high level numbers that are there with charging rates, etc. cetera, um, but that's to be finalised. Okay. But it but it is going to be run as a council asset. So the the lead up to that would be better to be discussed in PX, I presume, just as commercial sensitivities with regards to that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Would someone like to move that the report be received. Aaron, seconded. David, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. And um, now I'll move to um, uh, resolve that, uh, that that we um, uh, exclude the public for all of the reasons set out on the um, agenda, and that Rob, Paul, Joel, Lishke, and Bill Dwyer from Development Christchurch remain after the public is good. I don't think Bill's yeah, here. Yeah, Bill Dwyer's an apology. Yeah, so that's right. Us. Sorry. So. Um, and um, Tom Parsons from Innovate Consulting remain after the public for uh, item 28. That Mike Jacker and Peter Cochran from Tonkin and Taylor remain after the public have been excluded for item 30. That Paul Monroe of CCHL um, remain for the item 34. So I'll move that. Seconded by Andrew. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried.